three, two, one. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to another edition of what I call Soul Liberation Television. And tonight, for me, is very special because we are going to revisit 12 years ago the race war of 2028. I'm your host tonight. My name is Mayel Ibn Ra. I am the adopted foster child of Talik Ibn Ra. And I would like to dedicate tonight's show in memory of Angel Snub Nub 7, my father, Talik Ibn Ra. And just for a few seconds, I would like to just have a moment of silence. A moment of silence for my father, Angel Snub Nub 7, and all those who fought and they died and they sacrificed so that we could be here broadcasting in the manner that we are tonight. So thank you. Could you just close your eyes for a second and hold our heads down just for a minute and let's just give a moment of silence and memory. Thank you so much. It is a wonderful time that we live in 2040, but it was not easy getting here where we are today. It was the sacrifice of people like my father and all the great ones going way back to Marcus Garvey and W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, Nat Turner and Harriet Tubman, Sir Journal Truth, and the list just goes so, so on and on. Unfortunately, it took a, a great tragedy in order for us to be in the position that we are right now. It's not perfect, but I think my father would be happy to know that we seem to be on our way tonight. This evening, I'm so happy, soul brothers and sisters, that you can join me in revisiting the race war of 2028. Bringing back in memory and always never forget our fallen soldiers, men and women, who sacrificed and they died in order to make a future for us better. So we want to go back, way back, and examine the events that led up to the race war of 2028. 2027, President Donald Trump Jr., he decided to run. As you know, his father was president and he decided that he would run. And he did run against many odds. And just like his father, nobody didn't expect him to win. And Donald Trump Jr. became president of the United States, 2027. So when we examine 2027, what was going on? We have President Donald Trump Jr. A world war is looming because of the policies that, that Donald Trump Jr.'s father started and some of the things that white folks just do in general. As Malcolm X said, chickens coming home to roost. And so now the chickens are all coming home to roost. And the nations of the world have gotten to the point where they have gotten 
sick of the United States of America, their racism, their bullying, their silly sanction, depending on their stupid dollar bill, the people of the world, including other European nations, are sick of the United States of America. At the same time, during the Donald Trump Jr. administration, there's a great drought all over the world. There's a drought going on, including the United States of America. There's a water shortage. There's also a food shortage because without water, you can't grow food. You can't, you can't grow the animals. You can't grow the crops that you need in order to feed your people. So now there's a drought and a food shortage. And the drought and the food shortage is making the real people come out. Because everybody's surviving, everybody's trying to live. Your dollar bill don't mean nothing if you can't eat, you can't drink. And because of the policies of the United States in recent years, there's people don't want to, they're not exporting and importing in the United States. And the nation, which during good times pretend to be together, everybody is more divided. The white people are more to themselves. The Mexicans are more to themselves. Uh, of course, the black community, nobody did not want nothing to do with the soul community. So we always been ostracized. But now it's even more. Nobody really wants to do to deal with one another because you are sharing resources. There's not, a, there's not a lot of water. There's not enough food. And now the atmosphere full of these toxins from these factories from decades is coming down on the populace lower and lower and the people are filled more with cancers and sickness. And now it just take a little something to cause something to pop off. Life for soul brothers and sisters. They say times is changing. Things are getting better. But for the black man and woman, so brothers and sisters in America, it seems as though, and it is a fact, that things are the same, in fact, even worse. And we are beginning to learn as a people, no matter how much money we make, no matter how much education, no matter what we do, we will never be good enough in this nation. And because of the current drought and because of all the outside elements that's caving in on America, even our celebrities, even those who have money, those who think that this would not have an effect on them, is being, they are being affected. They are, they are seeing that the life they thought they was trying to leave in the hood. It has begun worse. And when America comes into this type of situation, they always need to find a scapegoat. And of course, the first scapegoat has always been soul brothers and sisters. And of course, since the time of Donald Trump Sr., there was an effort by the media, the racist media controlled by the Caucasian people to paint black folks, dark-skinned people as sex fiends and criminals and thugs and just savages. And so now it's gotten to the point where these races even attack the grave sites of our celebrities. The tomb of Michael Jackson was destroyed. These grave sites of our celebrities showing you these people really don't, they really don't lost it. They really don't care. Our celebrities is desecrated. In 2027, there was an effort and somebody actually used a rocket launcher to knock the head off the monument of Martin Luther King in Washington, D.C. It's still under investigation by, of course, the federal government. But at this time, they, they you know, they don't they don't care nothing about that. It's too much. It's too much stuff going on for the for law enforcement to care about a statue of Dr. King. In fact, 
good riddance to bad rubbish. They clean the mess up and make make things make America great again, which is still the war cry by racists and these others. Let's make America great again. 2027, something that probably would lead and would be the catalyst, the beginning of the race war in 2028. Some brothers and sisters influenced by my father's Mississippi campaign actually made a headway. And by 2027, they had established and renamed two towns they had come together and called that town New Africa in the state of Mississippi. And due to the leadership of a brother, Reese Rallahad, Reese and the brothers and sisters took the land and took the resources of those two towns, brought them together, created New Africa, Mississippi, and they used the donations and the money they could raise, and it became a thriving environment. In fact, made news all over the world because nobody thought it was possible that savages like the black man and woman in America could actually do something for themselves and thrive without white people. Well, of course, this is the United States of America, but still, Brother Reese and the brothers and sisters who was following his leadership shown the world and themselves and us as a people something proud for us to look at. And that town in Mississippi, New Africa, Mississippi, we as a people, we began to flock down to visit and see what those brothers and sisters was doing. And of course, it made international news. Thriving. The brothers and sisters growing their own food. They had cows and chickens and uh, a meat packing plant and other things. They was taking care of all their different needs, their barbershop in their town, their own barbershops and bakeries and all this. They were not depending on the white man for electricity. They had learned how to put up those, those, those large things for solar power using the wind. Man, beautiful thing all over this country. We was very proud of those who were part of New Africa, Mississippi. Then, of course, you always have those who did not like that. And they always was trying to find ways to bring negativity to something that clearly was a beautiful thing for us. There was no very little crime, very little problems coming out of New Africa. But living in the United States, you don't have to you don't have to ask for trouble. Trouble comes to your door when you have dark skin. What could be wrong? What could be wrong with New Africa, Mississippi? I asked my father and I told my father when I was a little boy, I was adopted by my father and his wife. I said, Daddy, that New Africa, can we go and live there? That's a wonderful place to be, Dad. And my father told, told me, he said, son, that's a beautiful, wonderful, incredible feat that was accomplished in New Africa. But it's, 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 it's too small. It's not in a position to survive when you have so much that's against us. I'm like, Daddy, what do you mean by that? My father told, told me that even though New Africa was a wonderful, beautiful thing, that we were going to wish that we had implemented what was called Operation Exodus Mississippi, which influenced Brother Reese and his people in New Africa, Mississippi. So everything from New Africa, Mississippi going very well, even though there's a drought, 
even though there's a food shortage, even all because of all these things going around seem to have no real effect on New Africa, Mississippi. But my father predicted something. And then one day we heard on the news that it was some homosexual people and some interracial couples. And my father knew this, knew this <laughs> my father knew this was coming because that's the way of America. You're living with a bunch of troublemakers. They wait till you get established. Wait till you doing really, really well. Then they're going to bring crap to your door. So there was a homosexual person who actually, they were relatives of some of the people in New Africa, Mississippi, and they wanted to move. And they was told that would not be allowed in New Africa. A part of the New Africa community was they did not accept those uh, who were lesbians and gays. And part of their policy in that community was they did not accept interracial couples in New Africa, Mississippi. So these persons began to file lawsuits against the community of New Africa for violations against an American citizen. And of course, New Africa was using their legal right to defend and show that they had the right in order to have this community to themselves. And this began to draw the media attention to New Africa. Negative, negative, very much negative media to New Africa. In fact, New Africa was not, wasn't even uh, by the mainstream racist media was not even called uh, an American town. It was called uh, a cult, some type of uh, what they call that. Anyway, it's, it's, it's uh, like like David Koresh, some kind of compound. They did not call New Africa, Mississippi a town. They call it some type of compound led by a cult leader. They call Brother Reese a cult leader. One of the followers or one of the residents of New Africa made charges to law enforcement that their child was being held hostage, that they left New Africa, but their child was, wasn't allowed to, to, to leave with them. And they also, also alleged that there was child abuse and other abuse in that community. And so this brought in the federal government and, and state and local authorities. The state of Mississippi requested from the town of New Africa that they be allowed to come in and inspect that community, house by house, and ask the citizens question. Brother Reese said, that's not gonna, that's not gonna fly. We're not doing that. We're doing nothing. Those charges, those allegations by this one, one person, you cannot do that. The court ruled that it could be done. Because as you know, the court is <laughs> the court is racist. Under Mississippi law, under Mississippi law, all allegations of, of child abuse must be investigated. And Brother Reese said, I'm not going, we're not going to allow you to come here and try to dismantle what we've built. And so the nego negotiations and some of the church leaders come into the into the community to have meetings with Brother. Reese and him and his people refuse. So of course, 
the uh, welfare, the Department of Welfare uh, Children's Services come in and they want to inspect, they want to see these children and they are accompanied by the police. And again, they are met with Brother Reese and his people saying no. And when Brother Maurice, I said Maurice, I mean Brother Reese, wink, wink, when they refused, as they was building this community, they, they fortified the community with different ways in order to defend themselves against an attack. And so just like Waco, Texas, and just like Ruby Ridge and some other places in, in the United States began the standoff of New Africa, Mississippi. And this went on for a little while, the negotiations, and of course, the position of New Africa is no compromise. There was no compromise. And so soon the National Guard is brought in to back up the local police. And as you know, those of you who was living during that period of time, you know that this did not end very well. I believe that they, the first thing the enemy started doing, they torn down their, their uh, windmill stations so they could not get electricity. They cut off their water supplies. They let their animals go. They run down their farms, hoping to starve Brother, Brother Reese and his people. And nobody does not know who fired the first shot, but it is alleged that Reese, somebody in that community, fired at the National Guard and the guard for, uh, fired it back. And there was, a, of course, the gun battle. And they even had a tank. And the tank shot shells right into the middle of the community. Many people uh, died and was injured. In a last ditch effort to, to defend his community, Brother Reese was shot down by the National Guard. And all those who survived the, that community, they were round up and taken, of course, to uh, to jail in defiance of state and federal law. And as all this went down, there were cries of there were cry there was crying out, of course, from the black community. But like I told you, the races had painted. New Africa, Mississippi as some type of cult. And before they actually began to make moves on New Africa, Mississippi, they began to use their media to paint New Africa as a cult. And so even though there were voices in the black community that did speak out against this atrocity and what the government was doing, nobody really took action because it was like you were supporting David Koresh, <laughs> you know, that type of thing. But my father said he had predicted something like this would happen. And the reason why they perished like that, because it was too small. It was too small against something that was very, very big. You have to be big in order to, to deal with something that's big. It's too small and it did not have the support of the 40 to 70 million soul brothers and sisters in this nation. They was basically almost alone. Even though many of us saw New Africa as something that was good, but at the same time, we doing our thing, they doing their thing, and my father said, as long as we're divided, 
nobody's going to survive. It's new Africa today. It's going to be somebody else tomorrow. After the destruction of new Africa, the racist Congress, aiming, of course, using law always against black people, passed a bill to give the death penalty even in minor crimes because of the food shortage, because of the drought and things of this nature, stealing from and whatever. And of course, our people being in the most desperate situation, they knew they could round up a lot of us and begin giving us the death penalty for stealing a piece of Kentucky Fried Chicken. So in 2027, it's getting worse and worse for us. But now, as you know, for the longest, we've been told that don't worry, things will get better. We're progressing. I don't have I described anything that sounds like it's progress. Sooner or later, brothers and sisters, something, something got to give. Something, something, it just can't continue this way. So July 4th, 2028, something that will cause and create the circumstance that would bring about the race war of 2028. A sole family, a father, mother, and three or four children, July 4th, 2028, in New York, I believe it was Queens, just celebrating the 4th of July like any American family, right? Okay. Suddenly, they were attacked by the New York City Police Department. Tear gas. Automatic weapons. The family didn't even have a chance to identify or say, or say, why, what's going on? It just, they were just raided. And the father just having a, a, a barbecue spatula in his hand, gun, shot down dead immediately. A case of mistaken identity, which clearly you can see these are children and the children shot down. A whole family of black people shot down. The mayor and the police chief of the state of the, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the city of New York say that it was a case of mistaken identity. And the culprits they was looking for are so dangerous that the officers was uh, they were already taught or trained, you know, do what you have to do. Don't ask no questions. The people they were looking for, they claim to be extremely dangerous. But now they know that this was an innocent family and you don't see any remorse or, or anything. And the police, Said the same thing they always say. I was just, we was just doing our job. This was not dark. This was broad daylight, brothers and sisters. A whole family of five, a mother, a father, children. Think a family of six, perhaps. Outrage from the soul community all over the country. Protests. You know how we do. Some of us want to take up arms. Some of us ready to go to war. But of course, you got the preachers and all these other folks. Calm down. Y'all know how we do it. Calm down. Let the wheels of justice. There's no doubt. We're going to get justice. This is broad daylight. A family of six. We're going to get justice. You don't have to worry about it. Y'all just settle down. That's what we was told. July, August, September, October. 
and the verdict comes in. And the jury finds, <laughs> the jury finds the police officers not guilty. And of course, there's outrage. And of course, the younger people don't want to hear it no more. The young people don't want to hear it no more to the point where the grave of Jesse Jackson Sr. was desecrated. Of course, the neighborhoods start going up in fire. But then all of a sudden it gets quiet. Why is it getting quiet? My father was watching all this and he got a telephone call from somebody. And this person was saying, man, what do we do? What do we do? And my father said, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I tried to get you to listen and implement the Mississippi campaign. This is not to say that these type of things would not happen, but when you implemented that campaign, we would be in a much better position to deal with things of this nature. And now, <laughs> But if you want to listen, I have something that we can do. And my father looked at his wife and my father looked at me. And my father is now in his 60s, going on 70 years old. And he told my mother, I'm too old for this. But I, I have to do this for them. They were hard-headed. They did not listen. But they don't have, they don't, they don't know what to do. They don't have, they, if I don't help them, they don't have a chance. Because after this, they're going to put themselves in a position where surely they are going to be slaughtered wholesale and exterminated, and that would just be the end of it. That includes my son. And he looked at me, and he told my mother, well, it's, it's time for me to die. And my mother, and my mother just didn't even, my mother didn't even trip off of it. She was like, I know. And I'm like, what? Daddy. So what a lot of people don't know is my father, when the Mississippi campaign was rejected, he just stayed in the cut. And there were some brothers he stayed in touch with who weren't ready to play no games. And now this was no time to play games. And the people, because they lost everything, there's a drought, there's a food shortage, you ain't got nothing. Your car don't mean nothing. Your money don't mean nothing. Your education don't mean nothing. Nothing. You don't have nothing to lose. It's come down to you don't have nothing to lose. So my father had a plan for them. And you can't depend upon me. Because when they find out, and they will find out because you have Negroes that will sell you out. They will find out. When they kill me dead, you must be able to understand what to do to continue this war, this fight. And so actually, the murder of that family started the race war of 2028. And my father and these other brave brothers and sisters, in fact, really, the soul community had gotten to the point, we were ready to go to war, all of us. We were not divided. We knew where everybody stood. This is it. The majority of us, we knew. This is, this is what my father told 
the fighters, those who were ready to, to do what it was necessary. They say, brother, what do we do? He said, look, whatever arms that you can get, you, you get them. You get them. But this is what I want you to do. We're going to play it smart here. Do not hurt civilians. The white people will kill us. The white folks will kill us. These races, this government, they will kill us. But we do not kill them. You don't, we don't go out and murder folks for no reason. We don't become terrorists. Don't do that. Only in certain situations where you must defend your life, then you defend yourself. But we do not go out and hurt civilians because in the eyes of the world, we will look like terrorists. Just run around murdering people because they white or whatever. You don't want that. We need the eyes. We need the, the world. We need, the, we need the, the attention of the world be brought on us to show to show the devilishment, the racism, the evil that's going on in this country. So when they talk about we are domestic terrorists, the first question that needs to be asked, who have we killed? What have, who have we murdered? But look at them. How many of us have they murdered? How many of us have they killed? We don't want that. We want to play things smart. You don't have nothing to lose. So we do minor things and we want to fill the prisons and the jails. Since they want us in prison, since they want us in jail, let's go. Take your whole family, go to prison, go to jail. This is the strategy, the strategy to lead, that's going to lead you to the promised land that Dr. King talked about. You got to play it smart. You're dealing with an enemy that's more powerful than you. You cannot deal with this enemy straight up. You don't have the firepower. You do little things. Okay, y'all want to play games with us? Then let's play the game. This is what you have to understand. When it comes to winning or losing a war, this is what you have to understand. The loss or the win is based on what you want. The South during the Civil War could be considered they was considered they lost the war. But at the same time, look how they was treated after the war. They were treated like with, with kid gloves. The, the, the federal government was real careful how they treated the South because they did not want another war. And this is what we must do. Put ourselves in a position so that these suckers, you don't want to mess with us again. We have never put our ass whooping on them. But how are we going to put an ass whooping on them, but we don't kill them? This is what we're going to do. We're here. We are here. So this is what we do. And you let the people know, well, we're suffering already, but you're going to have to suffer some more. You're going to have to sacrifice some more. You're going to have to support those on the battlefield, those who are willing to do the fight. Simple things that we do in this country. Trash on the highway. Just throw trash on the highway. Trash on the highway, interrupt the highway system. Just throw trash and glass and nails and garbage on the highway. Put their trucks on flat. Tear down the power lines. Dig up gas lines. Make sure when you dig up the gas line, that nobody can get hurt. Don't let it blow up. They talk about, well, they did, they killed. No, we're not killing nobody. Set all the houses that you can on fire. Make sure nobody's in there. Set their crap on fire. All these houses and things. These people are materialistic. So they can't go to their jobs. So they can't do the things they normally do. In the rural areas, burn down their wheat fields and corn and soybean fields. Let the animals go. Let the pigs go. Let the cows go. Open it all up. Just break windows out of houses. All kinds of little minor. You know, it, 
It reminds you of, of a mosquito. You know, the mosquito, here you are, big as you are, but a mosquito can pest the hell out of you. You cheek, bat like, <laughs> messing with it. You know, eventually, you will swat the mosquito, but look at all the bites. Look at all the bites that the mosquito do. This is what you want to do. You want to gain international attention because if it comes down to a firefight, perhaps you could get help from other people. Maybe you can get help from the Mexican community and others if you do right. But see, you, you get caught up in all this racist stuff. So you have mercenaries from Mexico and South America you don't know what mercenaries for hire, hire guns. You have to ostracize yourself from those. You don't want to kill those people that you call coons and Uncle Tom. They don't know no better. But you want to ostracize yourself from them. Because they won't be accepted by the races and they wouldn't, they would not be accepted by us either. So they be they be people without a country or people of nothing. And of course, you know, some of these Negroes going to be on the side of the races, part of the police department, part of the military, out to murder us. But if we do these different things because of the nitpicking, you don't have to mess with them outright. Because you live in a society where everything is dependent upon electricity. And every time you turn around, we tear down their electrical lines. Dig up the gas lines. Tear up the, the, rail, the railroad tracks. Mess up the highways. If you get dynamite, blow up, don't have to blow up the whole bridge. Just make it where it's unsafe for cars and trucks to go across. All kinds of little stuff like that. And we will continue to do that. And you keep doing that until these bastards say, all right, look, okay. Let's talk. Let's talk. And so my father and the other brothers, that's what they done. And many black folks went to jail. Many black folks went to prison and the, and the prison is already overcrowded and they didn't know what to do. And it's just, and you might have electricity and you might not have electricity. And you, 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 your car might be ready to go. It might be on flat. Somebody will siphon all the gas out of it. All kinds of stuff. And it's just all this going on. There's no peace. If black folks can't live in peace, nobody is going to live in peace. And nobody is out here telling the brothers and sisters, calm down. No, we are. We got to do what we have to do. And should have done it a long time ago. And actually, we wouldn't even have to be going through something like this if we had implemented Operation Exodus Mississippi because it put you in a better fighting position. But now, you just got to do the best that you can and use the best strategy that you can come up with. And so America is big and strong, and but the mosquito is still getting and you can't, they can't charge my father or none of these brothers and sisters with murder. Only vandalism. You can't say terrorism because nobody being terrorized. Nobody is being harmed. There are skirmishes. And there are very few firefights because the the, the key is, is, is violent, is not is nonviolence. Really. You need that. You need that on your side. And so we have those looking around the earth. The other nations is looking at America. Always trying to be humanitarian in other people's business, telling other people what to do. And they looking at how these brothers and sisters who are crying out because of an injustice being treated wrong 500 years. And now the rest of the world is seeing 
America for what it really is, the racist devils that they truly are. It got to the point where President Donald Trump Jr. got it got to the point where he was making a speech and he couldn't even hold back no more. And he basically said, we got to do something about these niggas. That's what he said. And he, he tried to clean it up. But he was like, oh, you, you know, come on. You don't tell me that you're not thinking that yourself. And nobody really said nothing because that's how people was thinking. These niggas, what are they doing? And what they really wanted was an outright war. And they wouldn't get in that. They wasn't getting they wasn't getting the kind of race war they thought in their mind they should be getting. Oh, everybody go get their AK-47 and all that kind of stuff. Let's go kill the niggas. And there's no repercussions. The eyes of the world is looking at this, and the only thing they can do is turn their nose up at America. Even some of even some of the Caucasian people in this country and the other citizens are starting to get sick at how all this has turned out. And one thing that happened that make this whole thing turn around is one day, myself and my mother, we were just watching TV and the FBI burst in our door. They finally found out that it was my father that was leading and guiding these people. And they they basically took me and my mother hostage. And they put out in the media that my father had to turn himself in or they cannot promise that something bad wouldn't happen to my mother and myself. And my mother was hoping that my father would not turn himself in. My father decided to turn himself in to save us. And this was on national TV. And my father was trying to give himself up. He had no weapons or anything like we normally, we, we don't do. He didn't have no weapon. <coughs> the only thing they could really accuse the, the people they was calling domestic terrorists with, with, with vandalism. Nobody was being murdered. Nobody was being killed. Nobody was being terrorized. Just the infrastructure. The way of life was being disturbed. My father came out to give himself up. And one of those pecker woods just shot him dead. And then when they shot, when that pecker wood shot, others shot out of, out, of, out, of, out of a reaction. And my mother and my, myself and my mother, we watched my, my daddy Gunned down right there on national TV. And even, even the even the Uncle Tom cats, the ones y'all call Uncle Tom cool, even they had to speak out. That was just, just outrageous. It was just outrageous. Other nations. After this event, made threats against the United States. America had a race war basically going on in the side. They cannot protect the borders. Countless people was coming inside the borders of the United States. And President Donald Trump Jr. was given an ultimatum, ultimatum from the world, really. You will cease and you will desist. China and Russia, 
other nations in Africa, all over the world, told the United States, you're going to stop right now. And of course, the races try to be tough and whatever, but they went through negotiations. And now we are living in a, in a place after this race war. Many suffered, many died. But we are living in the, in the type of manner that my father always wanted us to live. We are, we have established our own state and states here in 2040, there's a different president today who is now looking not to have something like this happen again in order to save this United States of America. We have found a, a, a place upon a land where we can establish not uh, our own Homeland for those who are the descendants of of uh, of uh, slaves with African or or Aboriginal ancestry. It's been a long, long road, and after all this death and destruction, because of all this and how this went down, and we knew that the only people we could depend upon really was ourselves. It took all this death and destruction and all these things to happen. And now we can finally begin to call ourselves a people and look at ourselves as a people instead of that group over there, this group over there, and so on. There are, no, there are now laws on the books created by soul brothers and sisters that white people obey. For hundreds and hundreds of years, there was not one law, there was not no kind of policy that white folks or anybody had to obey that was created by dark-skinned people, soul brothers and sisters. Now we do. We finally have, we got laws on the books. And Caucasian people have to obey the laws created by dark-skinned people. And these things, it's not like they really wanted to, but if, if they wanted to survive, you can't, America is, is bad. Nuclear weapons and all this kind of stuff. But you can't fight the whole world. You want to try to nuke the whole world, then you might as well say you're ready to die too. So if you want to live, if all of us want to live, like Spike Lee said, have to learn how to do the right thing. You have to try to do it. So now, here we are, 12 years from, from what was called the race war of 2028. And I just want to to uh, bring remembrance and tell that story and revisit and we tell our children and our children's children about the brave men and women. Unfortunately, they could have done something much better, but they didn't. But we want to still remember them for getting to the point and said, the hell with it. They refused to become docile and they just went for it. They filled the jails and the prisons. They did what was necessary in order to put themselves in a position to, to, to survive and put us in a, our, uh, their children in a better position. So I want to thank all of those who fought, those who, who died, those who sacrificed. My mother is gone. She's passed since since that time. So I don't have, you know, my father and mother, they adopted me. 
They was my only family, and I appreciate that. I miss them. And I appreciate, and all of us should, should appreciate the sacrifice that my parents and all those who said enough is enough, who echo the words of our sister Fannie Lou Hamer, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I done stood. All I can stand, I can't stand no more. And they found a way for us to make it. So now the only thing we have to do is stay on the path. The things that they set in motion, and if we stay there, we can do very, very well in this time. I'm getting old myself. So I say this to our youth. Those of you who carry the torch. Don't never forget the past. Never forget those who, who, uh, who led the way so that, that you could be where you are today. Remember what happened. You don't want to be like what we was. We want to bring in something new. So now there is no drought. There is no food shortage. It's still not happiness. It's still not good. But now we can, we know that way of life, the way that we was doing things, the way that was going on, we don't want to do that. You know you don't want to do that. You want to be something new. You want to bring forth something new. You want to make a transformation, like my father said, in the Mississippi campaign. We want to become something new. We are, we are not a color. We're not a skin color. We know we're not, we're, we're a, a, a people now. And you want to, we want to, Look out for ourselves, but you don't want to cause harm to other people. We need to learn how to live in harmony and share. I mean, life is, you know, like my father said, life is life is, is not meant to be happiness all the time. You're going to have your problems. But during the time of my father and my mother, it was nothing, it was it's something that the Bible calls nothing but pure hell. And people made that. Because of their greed. Because somebody wanted to be better than one another. Because a man thinks he's better than a woman. You know, sexism. That type of thing. We want to get rid of all those kinds of things. We want to bring into a new reality where there's justice for everybody. Regardless of your skin color, these differences shouldn't even be a factor no more. Just treat a person like you want to be treated. You don't want to be a slave, so why do you want to make a slave out of somebody? You want to eat. Why can't other people eat? Why are you going to deny other folks some of those apples from the tree? So there's a lot of lessons that we had to learn. And like my father said, just because you lose a fight don't mean you lose a fight. In this case, we won. We died. We used to we used to die and didn't get nothing. Now we die and, we, and really and we won. So thank you for joining me tonight and going back in the past and revisiting 2028 and hopefully we learn some lessons and we can go on to do better things. Thank you for joining me. Pass this along to, your, to our children. And let us always remember those who sacrificed and died so that we could live. Till next time, y'all. Soul Liberation TV. I'm Mayel.